I'm not going to go into the specifics of what happened there. Some of the stories that I read were some of the most brutal and disgusting whacks I think I've ever heard. After such a positive response to my Japanese folklore and urban legends video, I knew that I just had to follow it up. We're heading south of Tokyo today and I'm going to be explaining some of the Philippines' darkest, creepiest and most weird myths, urban legends and folklore. Let's get into things shall we? This is the Philippines' folklore and urban legends iceberg explained. If you don't know what an iceberg is by the way, it is a list type video with more general knowledge and lighthearted facts at the start of the video and as it progresses it'll get more obscure and dark. First up then, why do pineapples have so many eyes? This is actually a Filipino folktale of how pineapples came to be and the story goes like this. There was once a girl called Pina who lived out on a plantation with her mother. While her mother was very hard working, when it came to chores, Pina was a bit lazy and procrastinated a lot. She wanted to play and usually said she couldn't find the equipment to do her chores. One day, her mother told her to get her shoes from under their hut. But when Pina went there, she found her old doll and started playing with it. Her mum came to check on her, but when she said she couldn't find her shoes, her mother replied with, May you grow a thousand eyes. And then, Pina mysteriously disappeared. People from around the area went to search for her, but to no avail. However, her mum did find a mysterious new plant on her plantation, one that has a thousand eyes, they say. Her mum realised that she had cursed Pina and she was now a pineapple. From there on out, she named the fruit Pina, which in English translates to pineapple. Very peculiar urban legend, more of a fable than anything. And yeah, it's just so different to what we have here, which is why I want to do this video because their stories are so different and unique and we just don't hear them over here. So Manila is the capital of Philippines and it has a population of 1.78 million people. And Manila City Hall is the official seat of government for the city of Manila. Cool thing about it, some people think that it looks like a coffin. I personally think that it might look like something else, but maybe I just have a dirty mind. Its shape, however, is not modeled after a coffin, but actually from the Knights Templar, which symbolizes the Catholic Church. Still, a coffin-shaped city hall, mildly interesting, but we still have way more cool stuff yet to come. We have another Filipino fable here. It is the story of the monkey and the turtle. Monkey. It's lighthearted, it's told to kids, and it's at the top of the iceberg. So the story goes like this. There was a turtle and a monkey that were walking along one day as they saw a banana tree floating down the river. The monkey spotted it and so said that he would have the large trunk of the tree and he gave the turtle the small roots. The two then went their separate ways and planted their trees and while the monkeys died, the turtles had actually grown, having a bunch of bananas on top. He then went to the monkey to ask him to help get the bananas down, being a turtle that's hard for him. But once the monkey climbed the tree, he greedily ate all of the bananas and so the turtle wanted revenge. To enact his revenge plans, he placed thorns at the bottom of the tree that hurt the monkey as he got down. Wanting his own vengeance now, the monkey went to literally murder the turtle. And the turtle was like, no, do anything but throw me into the sea. And then the monkey was like, <laughs> you f***ing man. you shouldn't have told me that, mate. But then, once he threw the turtle into the sea, he was shocked to find out that turtles actually swim. And the turtle had masterminded the entire situation, minus getting his bananas stolen. Moral of the story, don't be a dick to someone who has shown you kindness. It's elementary. Instant noodle wax. This is a bit of Filipino culture here and there is a rumour that instant noodles, a student's best friend, actually have a layer of wax on them. Apparently in some tellings of this rumour, this wax can cause cancer. They say this because of how the noodles are compact when they get out of the packet but then they separate in water. And this happens because the wax melts. Many times people say that if you have some noodles, you have to wait at least two or three days to have some more. So if you get a packet of like five things of noodles, you can have some on Monday but then you can't have any more till Thursday or Friday. This legend dates back to the year 2000 and according to an article I read about this, there is no evidence that supports the claim, it is just an urban legend. Leaving your slippers outside, this one is a bit darker as is the iceberg chart again as we go along things are going to get darker and darker, so you have to keep on watching for that. The idea is that some people in the Philippines back in the 90s believed that if you leave your slippers out at night you would be killed by a member of a cult. 
this story spread around children's conversations like wildfire and acted as a deterrent for them to leave their flip flops outside after they're done playing. Now, some describe these cult members as Satanists that are looking for people to sacrifice, and they see the slippers as a mark and kill those that they belong to. Funnily enough, the site I read this from ended with the statement, maybe they have a fetish? You never know. Tabby Tabby Po, this is a Filipino phrase that in English translates to excuse me or may I pass. And it's most commonly said when a person goes to a place that's said to be inhabited by ghosts or goblins. It's said that if a person does not say Tabby Tabby Po when entering a location where these creatures are, there will be brutal and unforgiving consequences. So yeah, it is a simple phrase if you're ever in the Philippines and you go to a place that might be haunted or you might be engaging with mythological creatures, it's a good phrase to know. The idea of the Aswang is much more down the cryptid alley of things than anything I've covered so far. The word Aswang is an umbrella term for a shape-shifting creature. Now, from what I found online, there seems to be five major flavours of Aswang. Those being Witch, Vampire, Ghoul, Viscera Sucker and Were-Dog. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the first three and Were-Dog is actually the Filipino version of Werewolf, which I've only just found out actually that the Were-Creature is different depending on the continent and country. Like Africa has Were-Leopards and Russia has wear bears, but that is off topic. The one I really want to focus on is the Viscera Sucker because it is quite distinct to the Philippines. In the country, they're also known as Mananangal and they look like this. By the way, apologies if I mispronounce anything in this video, I don't intend to, but these words are not native to me, so I believe I got Mananangal correct, but in the future, I am going to be probably mispronouncing a lot of stuff. They say by day the Viscera Sucker is a beautiful woman, but by nightfall they separate the top half of their body and hide the bottom half. They then grow wings and go on the hunt for prey. It's said that they particularly crave fetuses. Yum. Most of these infiltrate human communities by the sanctity of marriage. So if you're from the Philippines and you have a beautiful wife, watch out if she sneaks off at night because she might be a Viscera Sucker. The crab mentality, this one has much more of a simple explanation to things, and it isn't as much of an urban legend as much as it is a saying or a custom, even if it is not a welcomed one. Long story short, crab mentality in Filipino culture is said to pull others that are succeeding down. Essentially, if I can't have it, neither can you. So even if I lose, you can't win. In Tagalog, I believe it's pronounced Isip Talanka. And yeah, as I said, it's not really an urban legend as much as it is a saying, a mentality that is common in the Philippines. Over here, we just call it toxic. If you're looking for something a bit darker and a bit more mysterious, however, look no further than the hanging coffins. It may look a bit odd, but this is actually an ancient custom in the Eastern world, with countries such as China and Indonesia taking part in the tradition, as well as obviously the Philippines. The tradition actually started in China. It started with the Bo people who are now extinct. They started it before becoming victims of genocide at the hands of the Ming Dynasty. And because there are no longer any more Bo people left, we can't ask them why they began this custom. A similar thing can be said about the Philippines. We really don't know a whole lot. We do know that the coffins are custom of the Kankane people of Sagada mountain provenance, but it's not the main form of funerary practice. It's said that these coffins are smaller than normal because people would be placed in the fetal position within them, with the belief that we should exit the world in the same way that we entered it. We also know that these coffins are centuries old and the people inside them likely crafted their coffins for themselves, and that depending on how high up the mountain they are, that is determined by how high status they had in the living world, with those at the top being of highest status. These days, the hanging coffins are a tourist attraction to visitors of the Philippines. Balete Drive is a two-way street in Quezon City in the Philippines. And while at first glance, it may just look like a normal street, according to many locals, this street may be hiding something supernatural. This being a white lady. And no, I don't mean a basic white girl or anything. The white lady is a common urban legend that surprisingly is quite frequent throughout every continent in the world. Now, the street was named after the Baleti tree. 
but due to these large overhanging plants, people were a bit scared of the street, and from the 1950s, rumour had it that this street was haunted. If you watch my Japanese urban legends video, you would know that each legend has many tellings, and this one is no different. Some people say that the white lady is haunting taxi drivers who commonly take the road, with some tellings saying that the white lady, when she was alive, was hit and killed by a taxi late at night. Another version says that she was raped and killed by a taxi driver, and her spirit now roams the street looking for the evil man. A further version goes that she was abused and killed by her own family, and she was living in a mansion on the road, and these days she haunts the road by trying to seek help from drivers going by. Whatever the case, many locals are still very scared by the streets. If you're looking for folklore that is verifiable, then you need look no further than the Manila Film Center deaths. This was a real event, and the tragedy occurred in 1981, as at roughly 3am on the 17th of October, during the construction of the Manila Film Center, the scaffolding that the workers were using collapsed, causing 169 workers to fall and become buried underneath quick drying cement. Due to the nature of this accident, neither ambulances nor rescuers were allowed on the site until 9 hours later. Apparently, in total, seven of the 169 died due to the incident. The building would be completed in 1982, and there would be a film festival held there in which 17 films would be shown, with many countries submitting. In the end, India's entry, 36 Charing He Lane, would win. And some people believe that the film center is now haunted because of the tragic accident that occurs there. Philippines red over blue flag, if you're looking to learn something interesting today, this might just be it. So this isn't so much spooky folklore as a cool little fact about the country's flag. If you've ever seen it, you might be familiar with this. The blue represents peace, the red represents war, and then it also has a white equilateral triangle and three five-pointed stars. Well, news to me is that when the Philippines are at war, the flag is actually flipped upside down, so now red is on top and blue is at the bottom. It's happened a few times in its history, but to my knowledge, the most recent was when the Japanese invaded in World War II, set up a puppet regime, and declared war on the UK and USA in 1944. Red Horse Beer. So I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure that I know exactly what this entry is talking about. I found two rumors online, so I'll tell you them now. So Red Horse is a beer, but apparently it might contain gin. This is allegedly untrue, but that is one of the rumors I found online. The other one is slightly more interesting, and this is when you buy a pack of Red Horse beer, there is a chance that you might find two different logos for it. One of which is the traditional logo, which you see all around. The other one is the logo of a horse smiling, and apparently this is very rare to find, but still every now and then you might see it. This is also said to be much stronger than the normal beer, which in and of itself is already known for being quite strong. Hence the rumor that it has gin in it. I believe it's like seven or eight percent or something. Very strong beer. However, this is one urban legend that I'm actually able to debunk because I have the facts right here. It says that the truth is that in 1992, the company changed their logo to cut the costs. I guess they're using old logos that were never used instead of printing off new ones or something. All I know is that they changed their logo, so the rare logo is the old one, but it's still in circulation. So I love Chinese takeaway. I understand that it's not the food that they eat in China, but man, Chinese takeaway hits different, man. Our next entry is a Filipino take on, I guess, a Chinese delicacy, and things are about to get very dicey. So, Xiao Pao is, as I said, the Filipino answer to the Chinese steamed bun. And yet, there is this old urban legend that Xiao Pao is made of cat meat due to the cheapness of the food, and also down to xenophobia, or in other words, racism against the Chinese. I'm not gonna go any further into that, it's just a thing. I'm moving on. When it comes to lost cities, I know over here, definitely by far Atlantis is the most commonly spoken about. The ones that are like mythological and we don't really know if they existed, definitely Atlantis. But if you head over to the Philippines, you might hear about another lost city called Birignan. Allegedly, this is an otherworldly place filled with Encantos, and Encantos happen to be mythical environmental spirits such as sirens, elves, and dark beings 
that are associated with the spirits of ancestors in Filipino culture. People who have seen it report a place of unparalleled magnificence and architecture, not even being matched by megacities such as New York or Hong Kong. This lost city is urban, yet not urban, being filled with cathedrals and spires. It's important not to get too attached though, because legend states when you're there, fairies and light-skinned beings keep on trying to entice you further and further into the city. And if you go deeper and deeper, you will never be seen again. According to legend, only those who have ever been invited to the city will ever witness it, being put in a trance-like state of possession by the Encanto to make sure they are more suggestible by attempting to lure them there. From there, not a lot is known about Birignan City, but they do say on cold winter nights, Filipino fishermen who are out to sea might see the dazzling lights of this lost city, and they are rarely ever seen again. What do you think then? Do you think Birignan City has ever existed? Do you think it does exist? Have you ever seen a place that you swear exists, but is unverified? Please let me know down in the comments. Also, I wanna know what's your favorite fast food joint because that leads us into our next entry. For me, it has to be Five Guys Burgers and Fries. I love Five Guys. But for many Filipinos, it is KFC, with the restaurant chain having over 300 outlets in the country. In 2014 though, many would be turned off the idea forever because a man in the country who I believe was visiting it posted a picture on his Facebook which would eventually go viral because he thought he was eating a rat. That's right, there was a rumour that went around a few years ago that KFC was serving vermin to its customers. In fairness, the picture that was taken does look like a deep fried rat. KFC bosses told the Mirror that an investigation found no evidence to support this claim. However, they did not confirm what the food was made of. So maybe it was just a large mouse or something. Still, the question has to be asked, what is the deal with foreign countries and having KFC as a part of their urban legends and folklore? Also, I should mention that eventually they did do a DNA test and it was chicken all along. Now, it has to be said that basically every country in the world is going to have its criminal underbellies and the Philippines is no different. The Atavan Gang is definitely an example of this. For many years, people did not think that these guys existed. People just thought that they might have been an urban legend, but as it turns out, this urban legend is very much real. I believe that people thought that they were a hoax because of some sort of email spam, but according to sources, the Atavan Gang is actually one of the Philippines' oldest gangs, and their way of taking advantage of victims is very clever. Filipinos are known for their hospitality, they tend to be very kind and courteous towards tourists, and the Atavan Gang will take advantage of this. They will invite tourists they meet for some food and drink, and once the tourist takes the bait, they will drug them with Atavan, also known as Lorazepam, and they will rob you, leaving you alone somewhere. To initiate this, you're often approached by a beautiful woman, and she's there to let your guard down, and that is when they will strike. Apparently, these guys robbed a 52-year-old Belgian woman who visited the country in 2012, with 15,000 euros being robbed from her. Luckily, the police were able to identify the perpetrator, so I think she might have got her money back. It didn't really say the article that I found, but according to legend, these guys are some of the most well-oiled criminals the Philippines has to offer. From one criminal group to another, the Davao Death Squad is the next thing I want to talk about. This is a vigilante gang based in, as the name would suggest, Davao City. The group is alleged to have conducted summary executions of street children and individuals suspected of petty crimes and drug dealing. Summary executions, by the way, are executions without a fair trial or evidence. It's estimated that between 1998 and 2008, in a 10 year period, these guys were responsible for the deaths and disappearances of over 1,000 people. This is where the folklore comes in, however, and I really don't want to overstep here because I really don't know much about the Filipino political system, but it is said that their current president right now, Rodrigo Duterte, who is massively anti-drug, actually has something to do with this. Currently, he is conducting one of the most brutal wars on drugs the world has ever seen, and as it turns out, he was the mayor of Davao City for the majority of when the death squad was active. 
The question is, was he allowing a group of vigilantes to go out and kill people that were deemed to be drug users and suppliers? The now president says that if you're conducting illegal activities, you are marked for death. So little conspiracy theory here, were they active under the orders of this man? Did he allow hundreds and thousands to die? As of January 2020, the International Criminal Court confirmed that an investigation into Duterte's involvement with the death squads was ongoing. The Filipino cooking creation story. This one is very distinct. I'm sure everyone knows the uh, creation story. At least the one in the West goes that God made Adam and Eve, and then those two had two sons and then somehow populated the rest of the earth. Doesn't make any sense. The Filipino cooking creation story is a bit different, and it's definitely got a lesson or a moral, so I'll tell you now and you can be the judge of what that is. So it's said that God had some clay and he molded it into his own image, putting it in the oven to cook. However, he was too excited to make humanity, so he took it out early and it came out very pale with light hair and eyes. Still, he loved it. He then created another sculpture, put it in the oven, and this one he was a bit more cautious of taking it out too early this time. So when he did take it out, its hair was curly and brittle, its lips had been thickened from the heat, and it almost appeared burnt when it got out. But still he gave it the breath of life and placed it next to the first man, loving him just equally as much. Then he put a third in the oven, but was more cautious than the first attempt, but he was a bit more hasty than the second attempt, with this creation turning as a golden brown. He then gave it the breath of life, loved it just as much as the rest, and from there he made many others throughout the years. And regardless of the colour, the story says that he loves them all. We're delving more into cryptids for this next one, and of all the cryptids I have ever covered, this one might be my favourite. His name is the Tambalalos. He is found in the Bicolano and Mindanao cultures folklore and is believed to confuse and misguide people, making them lose their way or go around in circles, sometimes chasing them around. The only way they say to escape him is to take off your clothes and wear them inside out. But here's the twist though. This thing is absolutely hung. I mean, I found this picture online already blurred and look at the amount of pixels, man. This demon has a huge donk. He's putting us all to shame. Mount Banahor is located in the south of Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines. And what makes this mountain so interesting is that some people believe that it is home to the supernatural. You see, legend states that this mountain has not only been visited by Jesus Christ himself, but was also the site of many alien abductions, with many hikers allegedly going missing on the mountain. With a mythical aura surrounding the mountain, many vendors nearby will sell amulets and magical herbs to ward off evil spirits. Whatever the answer to these mysteries of the enigmatic mountain, one thing is for sure, many people believe that there's something just off about this place. To any Filipinos watching, I have a confession to make, an apology almost. I have never been to a Jollibee's. I know it's a crime, but they just aren't so common in the UK. But to anyone that has been to a Jollibee, you might be surprised to hear that back in the 80s, there was an urban legend that to save on production costs, they would make their burgers with earthworm meat. Yeah, this is an urban legend that's been around for roughly four decades with a viral email chain accusing them of it in 2003 as well. But if you're scared right now that you've eaten earthworm meat, you don't need to worry so much because the chances are you are fine. As it turns out, to buy earthworms at large enough quantities to make burgers would be absolutely much more expensive than just getting beef from cows. Horse meat, that's another story, but you should be fine having not eaten any earthworms. The Mananambas is more of a traditional urban legend if you're looking for that kind of stuff. He is a scythe-wielding maniac whose name comes from the word tabas, meaning to cut, because he is said to murder people by cutting off their heads. Legend states that he comes at night, and this is where things tie into an earlier entry, he picks a slipper up among the ones left outside the door of a house. It is said that he will proceed to kill the owner of the slipper by beheading, and potentially even the entire family. So if you're in the Philippines, do not leave your shoes outside. Don't do it. You're going to get killed. Apparently, due to his appearance, he is synonymous with the Grim Reaper. Obviously, a scythe-wielding urban legend would be. The story of Mary Cherry Chua. From here on out, I'm putting a warning on. Things are going to get very dark, very creepy, very disturbing. This is one of the most graphic urban legends I think I've ever heard. So again, warning. 
So the tale goes that in 1972, Mary Cherry Chua attended an all-girls high school in Kiazon City. Friends described her as a beautiful, kind and intelligent girl with long black hair and creamy white skin. It was late night after school one day and she had not returned home. So her parents began to panic. They called up her classmates, none of which knew where Mary was. The following morning, they would find out as Mary's dead body was found in the schoolyard. An investigation soon launched, but it wouldn't be long until the culprit came forward. As it turns out, the school had recently fired a janitor for sleeping on the job, and in revenge against the school, he decided to rape and murder one of the most popular girls, that being Mary. He felt guilty, so he confessed and was quickly arrested. In memory of Mary, in some tellings of the story, it's said that the school erected a stone bench, but some say that if a person were to sit on the bench, they would be possessed by Mary Cherry Chua's spirit and would feel exactly how she did in her last moments on earth. Some other people say that if you happen to pass by the bench at dusk, you'll sometimes see a figure of a young girl, Mary, crying because her future had been taken away from her. Very mature stuff, very disturbing. Bahe Napula, which if I pronounced it correctly, is Tagalog for Red House. So this is a little bit of Filipino history that isn't really discussed in school. I don't think I learned anything really about the war in Asia during World War II. Much of my teachings were more focused on Europe and the Western Front and the Home Front. So as I actually mentioned earlier, the Philippines were invaded by the Japanese in World War II. And what the Japanese Imperial Army would do in Manila and the rest of the country would be some of the most brutal and horrific acts the Second World War had to offer. Long story short, the Geiki group of the 14th District Army under Japanese Imperial General Tomoyuki Yamashita attacked the village of Mapanique, a small area of the Philippines that has a population of today of just 5,000. Back in 1944, however, the army gathered and executed all of the men in the village. They then gathered all of the women and girls into this red house, raping and enslaving them. I'm not going to go into the specifics of what happened there. Some of the stories that I read were some of the most brutal and disgusting war acts I think I've ever heard. But today, the house still stands partially demolished. But there is a debate of whether it should be fully taken down or whether it should stand today as a reminder of the atrocities that the Japanese Imperial Army caused. To this day, the Japanese government has not apologised for the incident, and while the Asian Women's Fund was set up as a compensation to comfort women, none of the women from Bahe Napula ever saw any compensation, as apparently they weren't held or abused over an extended period of time. Absolutely shocking. Next up, the tale of the Cheong sisters leans more into the true crime aspect of things, but their story goes as such. It was the 16th of July, 1997, when in Cebu, a pair of sisters, 21-year-old Jacqueline and 23-year-old Mary Joy Cheong, were kidnapped outside a mall, gang raped and killed. While Mary Joy's body was found two days later, Jacqueline's would never be discovered. A man named Francisco Juan Laranga, also known as Paco, as well as six other men were deemed to be responsible for the crime. All of the perpetrators, minus one that was still legally a minor at the time, were sentenced to death for the incident. But here are where things took a bit of a turn. So when researching the case, Laranga's name is plastered everywhere. As it turns out, he is a Spanish citizen and allegedly killing him in the Philippines would be a breach of international law. And so Laranga was sent back to Spain to carry out his sentence. More interestingly to me though, is that there's a lot of people that claim Loranga could not have been involved in the murders. Apparently he was in Manila the night the two girls were abducted and there's an entire documentary trying to prove his innocence. Whether or not he was, I couldn't possibly say. As for the rest of the assailants, four of them were released in 2019 by Bureau of Corrections Director General Nicanor Feladon, but he was swiftly fired by President Rodrigo Duterte and the four men soon surrendered to the authorities within a few weeks. So it is to my understanding that they are all behind bars now. 
The Amamongo is yet another more cryptid-like piece of Filipino folklore, and there isn't so much on this guy to report, but I'll talk about him anyway. The Amamongo is apparently a man-sized ape. He is described as a violent wild creature that lives in caves near the foot of the volcanic Mount Canleon, but is rarely seen by human eyes, except in the case of Elias Galvez and Salvador Aguilar who in 2008 claimed that they were attacked by the Amamongo. However, scientists are quite skeptical at their claims. For all intents and purposes, this guy, if I am correct in saying, is Filipino Bigfoot basically, and so if you believe in the Bigfoot or the Yeti, he might sound plausible, otherwise he might sound a bit far-fetched. I don't know if you're superstitious, but if you are, have you ever heard of the possession of Clarita Villanueva? If not, you might become a bit more after hearing it. So, in May 1953, a 17-year-old girl was brought to Manila City Jail, charged with vagrancy, which is, to my understanding, essentially homelessness, maybe? She came to Manila after her mother died. Her mother never knew her father, but Clarita thought that he may have been in the country's capital. There, she would solicit men, but she was caught by a plainclothes officer that she had offered her services to. Over the next few days in jail, she began to tell tales of seeing things that nobody else could, and her stay behind bars turned from mundane to hellish. She would get attacked by things that were supposedly invisible, screaming hysterics and passing out when encountering them. However, it was the mysterious bite marks that caught the attention of those guarding her. She was being attacked by what she called an invisible vampire. It was roughly nine days after she was first brought in, the 19th of May, when she spoke to a pastor that came to visit her. She claimed that she had a deep hatred of God, making several further blasphemous statements. The city's mayor then came to visit her days later, and he claimed that he saw bite marks appear out of nowhere on the victim's hands. And while some people thought that there was a logical explanation to this story, others were convinced that this phenomenon defied scientific explanation. To put an end to this madness, they eventually performed an exorcism on the young woman and the evil spirits were chased away. And if you clicked on this video, you might have done it because of this next entry. The Ori Chef. I had to talk about her here. So a lot of you were waiting for it. Here it is. If you don't know Ori Chef, she is an internet urban legend and her story began spreading around Facebook. So what is this story you might be asking? Well, it's said that Ori Chef is a cannibalistic woman who loves to eat children. It all started back in 2018, even though her account had been allegedly active since 2015. So this account, when found, only had herself as a friend. And by this I mean that she did have friends on the account, but the only friends to this account were other accounts by the name Ori Chef, or one of her aliases which included Marjorie Chef, among others. Now, when looking up this account, many people have reported seeing very graphic, oftentimes gory images, something very peculiar, especially for Facebook. Now, an explanation for this is that apparently she was hacked, but this is unconfirmed, as is another explanation that apparently another 4chan user got into contact with Ori Chef, who explained that the accounts were created because of Facebook video games. The problem here, though, is that finding accounts created by the true Ori Chef in the middle of this wave of fake accounts is very tough. And the more people on the internet that learn about the legend of Ori Chef, the more people that make accounts about her, thus planting yet another tree into the already vast forest of confusion and misguidings. Some of the Ori Chef accounts have been said to contain some horrendous, indeed extremely creepy things, sharing some horrific stories and deep desires. But to try and uncover a kernel of truth here is simply very difficult. And so the true story of Ori Chef, why this is a thing in the first place, is a difficult question to answer and we may never have a solution to this problem. I hate to leave things on an unexplained note, but that's all we have time for today. So if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe. Otherwise, Ori Chef is going to come for you. Other than that, please let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see me do next, because I'm only 107 videos in and I'm already out of ideas. Thank you for watching.